Welcome. Welcome everyone to our lunchtime webinar. Uh, all this week we've been running webinars on different aspects of land and nature, one at lunchtime and one at four o'clock every day, because as we speak, Churches Count on Nature is going on all around the country. We've had over 240 churches that have registered to take part in Churches Count on Nature. So they're out in their churchyards looking to see what plants and insects and trees and birds they can identify and registering them so that we learn about the precious ecology in our churchyards. If you're listening to this, it's not too late to join in. Please do go out with your, your smartphone or your starter guide and see what you can identify in the churchyards around where you live. Uh, this of webinar is going to be a really, really interesting one about the Nature Recovery Network. Uh, when it's complete, the NRN will be a single network of joined up wildlife rich sites, helping us to reverse species declines across England by improving and creating habitats. And the, and that's the Nature Recovery Networks will also enable people to enjoy and connect with nature where we live, work and play, benefiting our health and our well-being. We're really looking forward to learning more about it over the next hour. I always begin my webinars with the previews of upcoming attractions. We're here on the Nature Recovery Network session and there are three more of the webinars left this week that you're very welcome to come to. So at four o'clock today, we've got a session on sustaining church using church spaces for growing food and growing mission. And then tomorrow we're going from the, the small scale to the big scale. So at lunchtime, we've got a session on urban hope, how we can create space for nature in a small space. And then we're ending the week with Pete Brotherton from Natural England talking about the big picture of the global crises of biodiversity loss and climate change and how we can look at those and address them locally. Once this week is over, we're back on to the... Uh, the, the, the normal net zero carbon webinar program that I run. Uh, we've got our session coming up in June on the changes to the faculty rules to help net zero carbon and then a session in September on how central procurement can help parishes. Right, in terms of the practicalities of today, as usual, we'll be using the Q&A for your questions rather than the chat. So please do find the Q&A, that's where to pop your questions. You can see other people's questions as well and you can put thumbs up next to the ones you're most interested in. After today, I'll send everybody the slides and any links that are shared in the chat. And we're recording all of the sessions and sharing them through our website so that uh, if you've enjoyed today and you want to listen to it again or share it with a colleague, you will be able to do that too. In terms of our speakers today, we've got such, a, such an interesting panel. Um, so Tony Juniper, I'm sure, will be a name that you have heard. Tony is the chair of Natural England. And before joining Natural England, he was the executive director of advocacy and campaigns at the Worldwide Fund for Nature and president of the Wildlife Trusts. Jenny Griggs is Natural England's social inclusion senior advisor. And the Reverend Suzanne Cook is the vicar at St Mary's Wooler. So we should have a really interesting and very practical panel. Let me stop sharing my slides and hand over to Jenny, who I believe is going first. Thank you so much. Can you see that, Catherine? Yes, that is perfect. I can see it clearly. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you for the welcome as well. So my name is Jenny Griggs. I'm the Senior Advisor for Social Inclusion in the Cheshire to Lancashire area team of Natural England. So there's 12 area teams and I'm, I'm in the northwest one. And really, this is a case study from Lancashire. Um, I'm relatively new in post. I've, I only started last year. But this is some of the findings that I've uh, sort of uh, been on a little bit of a journey within faith settings and see how, where we can create these links for nature recovery networks. Hopefully, my laptop's going to work. Otherwise, I might have to come off. Let's see. Oh, there we go. So. When we've met, uh, when I've met faith settings, this is the kind of um, information that we've discussed, and this is the kind of information that they feed back to me. And I think there's probably been nothing groundbreaking uh, within that. So one of my things that I felt about is, you know, where can I bring something additional, and you know, where can we sort of bring that information about the Nature Recovery Network? At the same time, and I'm sure most people will be aware, that there's some real sort of big movement 
Um, these are two, two from the Church of England, but obviously other um, faith settings as well are making similar sort of moves towards, you know, how can we have this real concerted effort to um, impact nature. From my perspective, um, one of the drivers is the Environment Act, which came into force last year. And when I was new in post, I was asked, could you go and do something in the uplands? And so I thought, right, OK, and not the usual suspects. So not farmers, not, not estates, as of which we've got sort of multiple within, uh, within the uplands in the northwest. So I chose Forest of Bowland because I've got personal connections to that. But also I thought, well, you know, faith settings, parish councils, grass vergers, they seem to be obvious places to start. And this really links very well to the John Lawton ideas around uh, bigger, better, more joined up. It's about habitats in the right place and the importance of wildlife corridors and stepping stones. So this fits really beautifully with inclusion. We can get people really involved with wildlife corridors and stepping stones. It's about making nature relevant to them. So we started with a survey and um, the survey was sent to uh, actually about 500 different people. I sent them to every single sort of parish councillor, um, church, all, all manner of community settings as well. But we wanted to use really family friendly language because we wanted this to be about things that people can see relevance in their sort of day to day life. And from that, we had 30 responses. Now, it's worth saying that the survey was done in, in um, collaboration with Face the Change, which is a, a Northwest based charity that has an eco remit, and some of you may already know them. So they actually did the survey because it's much easier for them to hold on to data than it is uh, for, for Natural England. And this, this map here is not really that easy to tell what's going on in it, but essentially the forest of Bowland's right in the middle of there, which is very uplandy. But on the edges, we can see that there were some churches who said, yeah, we, we're interested in doing uh, work with nature. And there's a bit of a cluster in Clitheroe there. And then to the south, there's a bit of a cluster in the mill towns around Accrington. So they're more community-based projects and the Clitheroe projects are more um, uh, face-based. It's fair to say that the feedback from the survey was, and then actually subsequently meeting some of the faith settings was that, you know, it's not always easy. So um, what, what some of the survey found is that burial grounds tend to have to be older to be kept for wildflowers, because if there are new, newer burial grounds, there's issues around um, feeling neglect for the dead, or it, it, it causes upset within the community. In individual congregation members report that sometimes they pay for stuff out of their own pocket. It's not always as straightforward, or oh, we've got this nice idea, we want to do some wildlife um, work within our grounds. You know, sometimes it takes comes down to sort of one or two individual uh, personalities. Sometimes those congregation members have also been badly treated. Um, and that's because of upsets around um, burial grounds not looking manicured and, and, and tightly mown. So, it, you know, it, it could be sort of codified in this idea of manicured virtuous nature scapes. It's reported that clergy often are, you know, up to capacity. They manage several parishes. And so they sometimes try and stay out of the day to day kind of elements of perhaps running wildlife projects and nature projects. Best practice projects have reported that they sometimes don't feel that they're supported by the higher bodies in the faith organisations. And also within individual churches, it's been reported that, you know, nature is nice to have, but we really have got more pressing issues. Um, for example, um, several, several churches reported, you know, the running of food bank is, is you know, is, is, is a high priority for us. And to sort of some of my own personal observations are that there is no immediate ins with the denomination. So I can't just rock up to one place and say, oh, you know, can we sort of make a change across a whole load of churches? It doesn't really work like that. And so I've decided to sort of take this kind of longitudinal approach of working with different faith settings and sort of almost like case study in one, see if we can get that right and see where's the learning from that. The downside of that is quite resource heavy on my time. So that's why I've been really keen to work with other um, charity organisations like Faith for Change, like the Wildlife Trust. But that can create its own GDPR issues in terms of like 
initially contacting people and that kind of thing. Also, at the moment, I'm just sort of, whilst I've had help in the past, I don't have any help at the moment. And also, um, and this was an idea from one of the congregation members, which I really, really liked, was this idea that if there was some sort of validation from a senior faith level, then it might make things easier at, at the ground level. And one of the ideas was a Bishop's Award for um, Wildlife. And so I've just cobbled that together on pain. It's, it's, it's not an official thing or anything. But what was interesting was that um, that, that seemed to you know, resonate really well, actually. I, when that's been suggested several times. So back to the survey is the good news that 78% said they wanted to do citizen science projects. And I have to say, Caring for God's Acres website, and I know Harriet's on the call, phenomenal resources. So there's no need really to reinvent the wheel. What's needed is the confidence building to use those resources. And, you know, there's latent demand for it. We know that. And also, you know, there's um, specialists within the area, particularly the Wildlife Trust within Accrington. There's a, an organisation called Prospects Foundation. So it would actually, it's not actually too difficult to organise this kind of stuff. Um, but I had a vision that we'd have a 2022 Bible. It's, but I was probably a bit too optimistic in my ability to, to influence that. And so... From that, I think I've got some learning of, you know, where are the next steps? Or, or is the alternative really that self-reliance is the key? You know, as I said, Karen, for God's sake, fantastic um, resources anyway. Do we try and just get um, faith settings trained up in how to use iNaturalist and get them recording and, you know, say, is that the way to the Nature Recovery Network? Success definitely is linking into existing initiatives and here's sort of a bit of a snapshot of what I found on, on my journeys and I've been also doing work uh, with uh, ethnically diverse communities as well so this you know it's, it's interesting and maybe sometimes you know the motivator might not be faith it might be the environment or, or vice versa you know and perhaps it's going to where people are. One of the things that I would love for, and I know Catherine asked me, you know, is, is there a call? And I think, so here's a, a couple of my things that I've I felt having spent time in faith settings. And just so you know, this, this churchyard is a churchyard where my grandparents are buried. So I have a personal connection to it as well. And these are wooden enemy and I just, it's stunning. It's just absolutely gorgeous, but they could only manage to do it in the older burial ground. So I would really love it if older burial grounds, there was an, a natural presumption in favor of um, wildflowers. Caring for God's Acre are the specialists within this. And, you know, it's worth pointing out that some churchyards have been there for centuries, sometimes millennia. Um, there are repository, uh, there are living Noah's Ark of often wildflower seeds, and they often can perform the role of being great green hay donor sites to, to sort of spread the wildflowers. The other, the, the flip side, if we've got to be careful with stakeholders, so it's better not to just turn a whole burial ground into uh, wildflowers, but to do test plots, to have signs, to have meetings. And this image is from Caring for God's Acres, but what I think is really interesting about it is that these people are not congregation members they're from the local community so maybe we need to think bigger that you know we have elderly congregations that the expectation isn't solely on the church that it comes a community initiative in in which to promote the nature recovery network also some of the industrial churches it would not be appropriate to do welfare so this is um, a church in Clitheroe Trinity and we're looking at maybe, you know, this is where we bring in our green infrastructure specialists and look at green walls, you know, and they were very, very behind that idea. One of the things that I've been doing with Trinity Church is actually supporting them in their Arosha Award. So they're really proud to have got bronze. They've been on a real journey. And next, they want to go for their silver. So one of the things is we've been looking at ways that I can support them to do that. And then a totally different tact is um, work with the um, Salford Diocese of the Roman Catholic Church with Bishop John, who has a remit across England, actually, for the environment and was very active in COP26. And they've been taking the review, uh, the view that actually that the power lies in working with teachers and schools, you know, um, churches are often massive landowners of school premises. And maybe if we train up the teachers through inset days, and this is, this is a good way to do this. So in my former role at Lancashire Wildlife Trust, I was part of the Carbon Landscape Partnership, and they've got some fantastic resources, especially around 
teach off the shelf teacher packages really so that we can connect school children and faith set into nature. So then my next steps in Lancashire really is some of my work is really just about signposting and matching uh, to on the ground uh, resources and plant life it is worth saying have fantastic free training online training so if we want to get into the nitty-gritty that's possible we need to look at how we ground truth nature recovery network maps and that will come further in the year when the local nature recovery strategies come out and are there obvious clusters where we can bring faith citizens together and i'm trialing one in clothes around it's fair to say that i failed to get into the east lancashire mosques of, of which there are a lot um, but the Clitheroe Trinity Men's Group has said they're going to support me with that. And so maybe, you know, some of these things are long term. They, they don't just happen with a few emails. And then a medium term approach would be to try and get the likes of the Wildlife Trust, um, Groundwork and other uh, sort of NGOs operating in the area better resourced. Burnley Council for Voluntary Service are really keen to support this and they're also experts in managing micro grants and so maybe one of the ways forward would be to have some sort of grants program and I've broadly sounded that out with Heritage Lottery and they were really behind that idea. Another way really to gain trust is a wildlife camera loan and we hope to sort of have a bit of a montage of what wildlife's going on across the area and looking at green verges with parish councils which is, is another piece of work. My um, dream really would be that there is some sort of national program so that the nature recovery network is an obvious step for faith settings and it's worth saying that there's excellent work that's already happening in this in this area with caring for god's sake uh, plant life and the wildlife trust being obvious ones with somerset having a, a relationship with the diocese of bath so my summary wish list older burial grounds for maintained for wildflowers um, each diocese has some sort of elder award. Um, there is national messaging, um, green infrastructure, where, where churches are sort of more industrial or don't have um, burial grounds, local ENGOs to be resourced and CVSs, and that there is a national offer uh, towards uh, nature recovery and faith settings. And that's me. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much. I think next, Tony, we're handing over to you, aren't we? There we go. Buttons press so we can hear hear each other. Um, thanks very much in, indeed, Catherine. So so good to be part of this conversation, looking at the role of churches uh, in helping support the, the the idea of the nature recovery network, and indeed its implementation and I've, I've had a few experiences lately actually which, which have really underlined this for me. Uh, one was um, at my daughter's wedding a couple of weeks ago um, at a church called the Church of the Holy Cross at Yelling in Cambridgeshire and uh, it was wonderful to be in the burial ground there next to the church and just looking at the amazing plant and insect diversity and then to be speaking with the vicar inside uh, after the ceremony and hearing about the bats that are living in there as well. And clearly, um, like so many churches, a real oasis uh, for wildlife, often in landscapes and townscapes and cityscapes that otherwise are quite bereft of, of nature. And indeed, one of the reasons why we find this uh, is, is because of the often ancient nature of these places. And indeed that church, the Holy Cross at Yelling, um, is actually mentioned in the Doomsday Book. So a very long history uh, concerning the land there and that little pocket uh, next to the church, which is so rich still in wildlife. And only this week I was out with colleagues in Dorset um, with the Natural England team. And one colleague who's, who's a grassland specialist, we were walking on a beautiful downland. And he pointed out to me that if you put a quadrat on the ground there, one meter, by one meter, you would find something like 35 vascular plant species. And he mentioned to me another downland near to that place where we were walking in central Dorset. And he said, you'd find the same there, he said. However, uh, if you cross over the wall into the churchyard next door, you won't find 35 species, you'll find 45 species. Really underlining uh, the contribution that these places, even some small pockets of land can make and not only in rural areas, uh, the butterfly recorder here in Cambridge recently was posting information about rare 
relatively rare in the city at least, hair streak butterflies uh, being found only in one of the churchyards in the city here, uh, where there are some um, surviving uh, regrowing elm trees. And so these places uh, we know are very important indeed and can make a huge contribution to conservation uh, across England. And you know very well from all the data that we've seen over many years about the decline of different wildlife, birds, insects, plants, all of those wonderful species that used to be so common, but which are now in many cases becoming quite rare. This is happening despite there having been a huge effort over the last hundred years or so for many conservation organizations and individuals, including in the statutory sector, including us at Natural England. We've been around uh, in different forms uh, since 1949, so more than 70 years. There has been uh, an attempt to stem this decline of wildlife. And of course, one of the things we've done uh, is to recognize important places, in, including through the work that we do, in notifying those sites of special scientific interest. But despite all the great work we've done there and in the declaration of national parks and the establishment of national nature reserves and all of the wonderful work being done by the Wildlife Trust, the RSPB and everybody else, we still haven't managed to turn that corner to stop the decline, level it off and then go into nature recovery. And one of the reasons why this has been so challenging, aside from all of the questions linked with pollution and now with climate change, we know that one of the big issues is fragmentation and nature hanging on uh, very often in small pockets here and there, disconnected from other pockets of nature. And from the review conducted by Sir John Lawton and published in 2010, the so-called Making Space for Nature report, which Jenny just mentioned there in her slides, this really told us that one of the big issues that we have to deal with is that fragmentation and the fact that nature is scattered across the landscape in these small pockets and that uh, alongside having bigger areas uh, of natural habitat and having better quality areas and having more of them, the other thing we have to do is to connect them all together. And so hence the idea of the Nature Recovery Network which was uh, highlighted in the government's 25 year environment plan, and which is now at the core, the very heart uh, of the work of Natural England is to be able to do that job of having more places, bigger ones, better quality, and crucially connected together. And so the Nature Recovery Network now is uh, a plank of government policy. It's backed by legislation and is very much at the heart of what we are trying to do. Now, if we're going to reconnect all these disparate areas of, 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 of habitat, it's not only about creating a network of places, it's also very much about creating a network of people and organisations and being able to bring them together to do this work. And that's why we've established a Nature Recovery Network partnership, and the Church of England is involved there alongside a whole range of other organizations, other government departments outside our uh, sponsoring department of DEFRA, uh, different private sector companies, so house builders and, and water companies, uh, and of course, local authorities, which are gonna be such an important part of building the nature recovery network, and then the landowners and farmers who look after so much of the country, bringing them in as well to be part of that nature recovery partnership working together through uh, different routes to be able to combine our different contributions in ways that otherwise um, you know, wouldn't occur. And so one new process that we have for doing this, and again, Jenny mentioned this, this is really, really important, is the so-called local nature recovery strategies. So these will be led by local authorities uh, beginning uh, this year and next year, starting to piece together through partnership working, through bringing all of those different actors together to start mapping out across different parts of the country. And these will be pretty much county led. These will be county level exercises uh, that will attempt to set out where the good nature still exists and where we need to repopulate uh, in areas where it's absent by joining up and reconnecting uh, the countryside in ways whereby animals and plants can start to move more freely 
uh, across the land. So this is going to be a hugely important step. Natural England will be supporting uh, those processes. We will have uh, one person across the country in every county uh, supporting those local nature recovery strategies. And obviously having the church involved and the churches involved in this will be very important indeed, um, not only because of the ability to, to be bringing in these wildlife rich habitats that still remain, but also those connections that occur through to the community, through the different connections that churches have in that way. So a very important contribution uh, should the churches wish to be involved. And as we're thinking about uh, that process of nature recovery, let's not forget it's not only about uh, the bats uh, in the churches or the wildflowers and birds in, in the grounds. This is also a, about beauty and tranquility uh, and maintaining those places that where, where we can uh, restore the human spirit. And, you know, churchyards are, are one of those places that we can do that. And alongside that biodiversity and, and the beauty and tranquility is that role we can play in contributing uh, to ecosystem services. And so the trees in churchyards, for example, helping to clean up the air, uh, as well as being part of that uh, place where people can enjoy the natural world, which we know is so good for health and well-being. And on top of those three big contributions that nature recovery can make, is that contribution that comes with the alignment with the protection of the historic environment. Uh, and what is more historic in much of our country uh, than churches and those beautiful places that attract uh, so much interest uh, from the point of view of being able to look back at our past. And actually one thing I would say about churches in particular, in terms of that connection with the past, is the extent to which we do seem to have lost somewhat in our modern world, that sense of the sacred when it comes to nature, and the extent to which it was the case uh, before the, 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 the period of enlightenment, during the medieval period and before, that people used to see God's creation manifest in the natural world, and therefore the natural world having a sense of the sacred about it. And so for all these reasons, I do think it's hugely important that the churches are involved in this nature recovery network idea, because the contribution is not only practical in the sense of those places being rejoined to the wider landscape, but also rejoining us to some of the things that we've lost uh, from our collective culture and our collective wisdom, and also connecting people with that wider community of actors who need to be a part of the solution to nature decline. So very much looking forward to this being a part of a much longer conversation that will go on over the years ahead, and which will do so much towards rebuilding uh, that uh, natural, vibrant um, web of life that we need to have around us for all those different reasons, not only for nature's own sake, but also for our spiritual well-being too. Thanks very much indeed, Catherine. Thank you so much, Tony. It's, it's fascinating to hear that overview. Um, Suzanne, I think we're hearing from you next about your own local experience. <coughs> Thanks, Catherine. Uh, yes, I feel like I'm going to pick up a little bit um, on what Tony was just saying, particularly um, in relation to that kind of spiritual element. So let me share my screen here. Uh, hold on. There we go. There we are. Okay. So, um, Firstly, just to say hi, my name's uh, Suzanne Cook and I'm the vicar here up in the very north of Northumberland. I have some of the Scottish border in my, I'm proud to say, in, in my, on my parish boundaries. Um, and I, I think I'm here today to help map out a little bit the connections between nature place and that thing that is actually quite difficult to talk about, that thing, spirituality. Um, but first, if you just indulge me for a moment, I'd just like us to pause just for a second. So um, I'd just like to think, and for you to think about your own experience of being in nature, of 
the sights and the sounds. This is one of my favourite places, I have to say. It's a place called Carey Burn, which is not far from me, and uh, I'm fortunate enough that I can walk my dogs here. And I can hear the sound of that water and the birds, and sometimes smell the heather. Maybe you have a special place as well, a place that you go to stop just for a moment. Maybe it's a place a little like this, or maybe it's somewhere really different. And I wonder if when you're in this place, I wonder if you get the sense that somehow you are part of something much, much bigger. And somehow when you're here in this place, that maybe you feel that life gets a little bit easier, that things make more sense that life is less confusing. So I wonder where that place might be for you. Now, I believe that many people, young and old, are trying to make that connection. And I have to say thank you to um, lovely Amy Baird for, uh, for taking these photos, some of these photos for me. She's uh, very kind and let me use them. And she's a young person uh, who I, who takes just the most beautiful pictures that really um, acknowledges, I think, her connection to, to, to nature and to the natural world. But of course, lots of people are making this connection, especially we see that up here as the number of visitors um, after lockdown and since has, has just increased exponentially. And this is a beach called Beadnall and it's incredibly busy. And even here, I think that kind of ribbon of, of, um, of uh, mobile homes just tells us that you know these places are, are, are under pressure but our young people and older people are walking and they're swimming and they're climbing and they're mountain biking and uh, it seems to be a trend that's on the increase urban people moving to the countryside and more and more people visiting and enjoying the beautiful places and spaces around the UK. Again, our fabulous causeway at sunset, looking out towards Lindisfarne. And uh, if you'll allow me just to, just to digress slightly, but I, help, I think it helps to make the connections here. An interesting um, trend is something called pilgrimage. Now you will indulge me because these are my photos. I actually went on pilgrimage uh, fairly recently. And pilgrimage is really more than a long distance walk, but rather a way of encountering yourself. And, uh, but vitally, it's uh, a part of this journey is, is how you relate to the natural world. Now, probably one of the most famous routes that we can talk about uh, is the Camino de San Santiago de Compostela and this is that if, if for those that might have walked it this is this is the sign you look for um, uh, endlessly during your days but pilgrimage routes and long distance walks are being developed around the world and actually here of course uh, pretty much past well certainly past the front door of one of my churches is the Cuthbert's Way again which is uh, becoming more and more popular so um, a quote from an article that I found in, a, in a, an edition of the National Geographic magazine that was uh, looking at the, the, uh, the rise in popularity of pilgrimage routes and particularly in relation to the Camino. And it uh, really beautifully, I think, describes the experience. And again, this, this is actually one of my pictures and I do remember this day so vividly. But this is a quote from somebody called Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl was even more impressed by her natural surroundings. Despite enduring a baptism of fire along the way involving blisters, bed bugs, and four days of solid rain, she says, I'll never forget the divine smelling eucalypt the eucalyptus forests and the remote desert-like plateaus where there's nothing but open horizons, sand, and the sound of your own thoughts and footsteps. 
numbers walking pilgrimage routes have skyrocketed with numbers of the lesser known routes and this would be one of them this is the Camino um, the coastal Portuguese Camino and I did the literal one which was literally um, along the coastal edge as the name would suggest and uh, these numbers are going up at, you know as I say uh, this this route uh, the numbers of people walking it had gone up a hundred percent within the last few years and I think this quote expresses beautifully the next quote, the process that happens during a pilgrimage. After several days walking, when the mind calms, you observe your surroundings more keenly, seeing simply simple things like rocks, flowers and birds, as if for the first time, the outer journey from place to place becomes an inner journey from head to heart. Of course, the interesting thing about pilgrimage that it is acknowledging a spiritual element to that walk. And of course, some people have a difficulty in describing things as spiritual, but I think, you know, language is, uh, is, is tricky, isn't it? But, but there's definitely that kind of more mysterious element of for why people walk the, the Camino. And I had lots of conversations with people, nearly all of whom were not religious. Um, obviously religious. But of course, some of us are luckier than others to live in places or have life circumstances where we're possible to make these journeys or live in these kinds of beautiful places. For others, they are not so fortunate. And for most people, maybe the summers uh, look more like this, living in very close proximity to others where it's difficult to find that peace and sense of solitude that is so helpful in connecting us to ourselves, but also to nature. And uh, I think those two can kind of uh, change places, can't they? Connecting us to nature and therefore ourselves. But if you remember the quote from the last slide, for many there is a clear correlation be between being altogether immersed in the natural world and developing that sense of connection to it. Many will not want to recognize or identify that sense of being religious or even spiritual, as I just said. But there is no escaping the sense that the way people speak about their experience of being immersed in nature has a transcendental, tran transcendent feel. What seems to be the case, and I believe you can hear it in the words that they speak and in the photographs they take and the books, the numerous books that are written on the subjects, there's a way in which people are trying to connect with the natural world in a completely different way, that they are somehow acknowledging that the way in which we relate to both it and each other currently is not working. And it's leaving modern people feeling isolated and lost, despite living in such close proximity to each other. This is the situation we find ourselves in. Our natural world is in crisis, and we need all people to work together to find solutions, whether urban or rural. And so we come to the part uh, church communities might play in facilitating that connection. And I know we've, we've obviously heard some fantastic stuff about the ways in which people are already doing this, but um, just to kind of connect that directly with that sense of, of spirituality that people feel. And Tony just uh, just um, was was mentioning uh, our tradition, the Christian tradition, and certainly that tradition um, understands the importance of the natural world. Our scriptures, the Bible, is soaked in the language of creation, and certainly for the religious order of Saint Francis, the Franciscans, the natural world, creation, was the first Bible. It's the way God first speaks into time and space, first, first makes God's self known. But um, I think it's true that um, in some ways that, that kind of uh, tradition has been undermined as we come into the industrial and uh, in, uh, the uh, post-enlightenment age, uh, things change very, very much. But uh, many of our church communities are indeed 
at this moment try to trying to um, undertake and reconnect with their sense of responsibility towards nature and um, and we've seen and heard about how the Church of England at national and local level are taking up the mantle of reconnecting their communities to their responsibility to care for the natural world and for most of us uh, we have as we've heard that resource that could help in reinvigorating and re-establishing that connection. And I think now what I'm talking about is specifically reconnecting with that sense people have, um, that connection they have in themselves to something bigger than themselves. I think this is what I'm specifically trying to kind of uh, map out here. And not just for our congregations, but um, also for the communities that we live amongst. So um, again, we've, we've begun to touch upon how the local church is a network hub, but I think in many respects, I'm sure this one all came together, I could not make it split up. Um, churches are um, really, I mean, I know that um, uh, we've had uh, a, 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 a kind of a, a way of speaking in the Church of England that says that there should be a worshipping community in every town and village. So when we talk about the network of the local church, we're really not, we're not, um, we're not, we're not messing about there. And actually, I wonder if there's nearly any community that is quite so, um, so decisively spread throughout our, throughout our country, uh, throughout the, throughout the UK. And um, for many places, uh, these are hubs of community activity. It's not just for our church communities. They're meeting places for community groups, for families, for schools, for the elderly. Our churches have so many ways in which they connect with the, with the local community. And despite the fact that we, you know, we are constantly told that our Sunday figures are falling, and they may or may not be, but um, that nonetheless doesn't diminish the fact that we have this um, network of connections and that church communities, their clergy and their licensed workers, all the people involved in, in running these churches, provide essential services and act as a network of information, skills and resources. So um, we continue to be influential members of our community. And I think the vicars, you know, they have a way of connecting and a kind of an influence in their communities that, that, are, that is really quite unique, even so, even though um, that, that's something that we, you know, struggle with, there's tensions there, but nonetheless, you know, we have a, a special place within our communities and are certainly key stakeholders in the well-being of the people around us. So some of this we've already kind of covered, so I'll kind of go through it. But with this in mind, we have a new unique position in society, rooted in our communities through people and place, um, and still a physical presence in nearly every city, town and village. Our churches and their churchyards provide us with a physical link between our communities and nature. And as we heard from Jenny and Tony, church, the churches count on nature, the uh, God's own acre, um, and all our different eco church. Um, I'm proud to say that one of my little tiny churches has the silver eco church award. Um, and it, it's really a fantastic way for our communities to become involved in nature and nature recovery. So we can see the potential of this by the number of contributions that were made to the um, beautiful burial ground portal um, last year, over 17,000 pieces of data recorded. So this is um, a fantastic contribution to our knowledge and understanding of biodiversity in our churchyards. And I'm ever absolutely astonished by the, by the number of fabulous um, uh, plants and, and flowers and stuff in one of my churchyards. This is, this is a picture of it actually. Um, but of course, as these data collection activities are connected to the local churches, we open a door to an opportunity, an opportunity for people to make a deeper connection to these beautiful places that embeds their commitment to nature and the environment. And, uh, and I couldn't help thinking that, you know, if we're thinking about why perhaps, you know, nature is still on the decline, I can't help thinking that it's because somehow we, um, you know, if we could just strengthen that sense of, of connection people have, and you can call it, spiritual, we'll call it spiritual for the sake of this conversation, that spiritual connection that people have to 
to their environment, to nature. So in conclusion from me, a conversation about the human connection to nature that tries to leave out the less tangible, the difficult to articulate, the spiritual, and the sense of peace and connection that comes from being in nature will always feel somehow incomplete. Not quite representing the full dynamic relationship we have with the world around us, not quite um, representing the power of being immersed in nature. And it's important in a secular world, however, that this conversation is shared that it recognizes the deeper, more mystical perspective of people's experience, but it is not owned by any one group or any one organization. However, it's clear our task is urgent. Our natural world is in crisis, and for those who are Christian and those who are not, it is our responsibility to do all we can to protect our awesome and beautiful planet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Those are some beautiful photographs that you had there. Thank you. I love the one of Beedenall Beach. That's where we were for our Easter holiday. And it's just oh, really? a lovely place. Oh. Uh, right, we, we've got some questions that have come in. I just thought before I started with the questions, I would take a second just to screen share this is building on exactly what you were just saying, Suzanne, about the, the Church of England being local, local everywhere, that every one of these red dots is a Church of England church. And, and I think that just, it shows the opportunity and the role and the contribution that, that the Church of England churchyards can make to the things that we've been discussing today. If every one of those red dots was managed, actively managed for people and nature, the difference that it would make. Now, let us come back to the questions. Uh, so everyone listening, if you've got a question, please do pop it in the Q&A. You can also see other people's questions and you can do the thumbs up next to the ones that you are most interested in. So the one that is at the top of the list at the moment says, I totally agree with everything Tony said. How do we engage those who are so separated from nature that they can only focus on being tidy? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? How do we engage the people who think that nature needs to be strimmed and, and tidy everywhere? Well, I would say, Catherine, that this, this is one of the least appreciated yet most important challenges that we face in making this transition to nature recovery and the extent to which we often don't really delve into the cultural dimensions of all of this. We have a lot of scientific discussion, uh, which we then translate into policy ideas and then turn into initiatives uh, with funding behind them. And that is all essential and it's vital, but very often those initiatives don't achieve all they might because they're, they're meeting a cultural resistance, which, which um, as I say, is not necessarily very well understood, but you, you could call it, you know, the propensity for tidiness. And, and so, for example, in Dorset the other day on the trip I was there, I was hearing um, from people who are trying to leave unmown verges and grassland areas around Dorchester, hearing about the complaints they get. Uh, you know, the place looks as though it's unkempt, it's untidy, it's neglected. The fact that it's got nesting corn buntings right by the side of the town and there's uh, birds coming in and, and foraging there, loads of different kinds of wild flowers. Uh, the fact of it being seen untidy it, it, it is a real barrier to making progress. And so what we do about that, um, it's a complex question. It's partly about communications, but it's also very much about the experience of the people who you know have reached those views over many many years it's not something you can correct just by telling them they're wrong or saying they might want to think differently this is something that that is about the way in which our entire society gets its ideas and you know that goes back to school it goes back to the way in which organizations and and you know di different entities um portray what they think is a good way of things being and so it's quite quite a task but it's one we really do need to rise to 
and this is one reason why at Natural England we, we've um, placed a, a very strategic program at the center of our work, which we call Connecting People with Nature. And there's many different dimensions to this. And Jenny's work through the inclusion team is a part of that. We've got research going on, our, our people, uh, a nature survey that we um, conduct and uh, hopefully doing a little bit of communications here and there, which is going to help people see the benefits of these wilder places, which previously they thought looked untidy, but which in fact are bringing a big range of, of, of benefits. So I guess it's really a question of emphasis and where we, we between us, put, put our efforts. And as I say, you know, the initiatives, the projects, the funding, the policy, it's essential, but let's also all pay attention to that cultural dimension and again the churches with their community connections have got a huge role there i would say and jenny yeah and i'm sort of going to answer another question that i actually typed an answer for is why, why would there want to be a bishop's award when there's already the eco church award and i thought it's a really good question that and i, I was trying and obviously i can't speak for the the the, the, the person but it was some kind of validation from the diocese to say, you know, we're also really behind this initiative. So, so I think that's what really that was about. That that Tony's right. That there's no there's no quick fixes here, um, but maybe it's bringing lots of different strands together, and also perhaps the community coming together to perhaps to help with the scything would be part of that. You know, that it isn't just about individual congregation members maybe what we what, what we have to think about is that collectivization um you know so that it becomes everybody's responsibility and and maybe there's a role there as well with the schools interestingly and i didn't say in my in my presentation but everybody said oh you must go into the schools and the problem is is there's just one of me really so it's it's it's, it's hard but you know it's it's multi-level and how, how we do that so perhaps the inset training is part of that as well the, the teacher training and suzanne Yeah, um, I suppose I'm I, I'm answering for just from my perspective of being a vicar and being and and absolutely having had this discussion fairly recently. To be fair, um, you know that we not only does it cost us two hundred pounds a time to get the churchyard cut, um, but um, you know it's not really what's it, as you as you just said. You know it's pretty essential that that we're we're not cutting. But if we don't cut, we get such. <laughs> you know it's it's um it 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 is very difficult, and uh, we do get a backlash. There's no doubt about that. Um, it does feel to me, and, and some of um, the other part, the other um, people that are listening will probably have something to say about it too. But if if you can just maybe start with small patches, and I think that was something that jenny um suggested you know mm -hmm. just because it, it just begins to educate and then you can then you can try and explain because sometimes it's just education but the problem is that if that's your grandmother's grave you want to see it tidy you know and that's somehow disrespectful for it not to be and this is this is kind of what we're up against so it's it's a it's a dialogue i think really I'm going to put in the chat, there's a really useful page on the Caring for God's Eco website about simple signage, because certainly what's come over when I run webinars with them is about start small and, and put really clear signage and communicate and communicate and communicate about the fact that we're not neglecting these areas, we're actively managing them for people and for nature and, and what that involves. So I'll just pop that signage thing in there. Now I'm conscious we've got six minutes left and quite a few questions. So let's see how we can do. Um, there's a question about engaging with local councils. Would you advise, a uh, question for Tony, would you advise contacting your local council to declare a nature emergency if they haven't already done so as an encouragement towards prioritizing nature recovery plans and recognizing how important this is this work for us in Sheffield and Rotherham councils. Um, thank you, Catherine. Well, it, 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 I, I don't think it would do any harm. Certainly the uh, work that was done a few years ago, um, led by Extinction Rebellion to, to encourage uh, different tiers of government to um, declare a climate emergency, uh, it, 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 did, it did help move things up the agenda and the, the nature piece was there at the time tended to be in the shadow of the climate story, which has tended to dominate these environmental discussions over recent times, um, but it's catching up. And I, I think, you know, recognizing that the nature side of, of the environmental emergency is every bit as 
important as the climate one will you know help to rebalance the discussion but then I think it's really important to follow through with the practicalities of what we do about it as we have to do on climate change because you know make, making a, a a broad statement and and then not doing much about it doesn't really take things forward so you know engaging with those local nature recovery strategies as a as, as a you know a follow through to, to that um, asking for the emergency to be to be recognized I think is really important Catherine, if I may, I've just thought of something else about that cultural piece we were discussing a second ago, which is about, you know, the way in which we receive this idea of, of wild and, and how, you know, often people reject it. And I think that cultural piece, you know, there's something even deeper, which is, um, you know, it's about philosophy uh, and the guiding principles by which we kind of live our lives. And to that extent, I do think there's something really quite important that the church can do here. In, in making that connection between creation, the sacred, and and you know the the teachings of the church, and I just wonder if there's something that can be lifted up there. Maybe not one for today. Maybe that's a whole other web webinar at some point. And I, I know you do think about that and do talk about it. Um, but maybe there's more that could be done through. I don't know what what routes there would be in the church to do that. But I think some of this stuff we're dealing with and wrestling with it's really deep seated, and it does go back to some of these really quite kind of fundamental ways in which our society works and you know doesn't see the nature piece for what it is um uh, you know th this multi-layered uh, set of challenges which, which you know are as we've discussed on this seminar today you know it's about nature for its own sake it's about the ecosystem services it's about beauty but it's also about this spiritual piece and how we get that more more into the discussion I'm going to turn now to a question from Kate about the the practicalities if someone is listening today and thinking right, I want to be involved with that. How can, how do people listening link up with the Nature Recovery Network near them? How will the Nature Recovery Network be reaching out to local communities, um, both to the churchyards, but also to community volunteering groups and to the local council contractors? How, how does it get joined up practically? Jenny. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that. So, there's, so as well as the faith settings, I, I'm, I mean, I'm only, only speaking for myself across the Northwest, but there's a whole host of initiatives of uh, colleagues, particularly within Natural England, trying to link up around the connecting people with nature and our shift three, which is tackling barriers to nature as well. So I think it's worth a little bit seeing how the local nature recovery strategies pan out because they, they will really they, there has to be some element of ground truthing, like ecological maps, you know, there's one thing saying, you know, we want, we've got ideas of you know what would be good things to have here but then it requires that people input and so I think there's going to have to be some sort of proper opportunity for engagement within and then that will in effect will affect the nature recovery network. I think the other thing um, role within Natural England is this sort of on the ground intelligence to feed into the like nature recovery strategies I, I'm certainly finding that's a big part of my my work as well so but also that just to say that there's so many third sector organisations doing brilliant things that that hold these spaces and networks that maybe it's just carrying on doing the same and really just trying to be more joined up. You know, the, the Lawton principles aren't just about nature, they're about people as well. How would they find their local Jenny? If they're yeah, thinking, well, how do, yeah. who do I connect with at Natural yeah. Because it's okay. this big organisation. How do well, they find it? It'd be very tricky to to connect with somebody straight away at Natural England because we're still all we're, the, the, the people with nature staff are relatively new I would think my first port of call would be the council for voluntary service within an area to see what's going on on the environment side because often they even run their own um, grant pots and things and then I think you know it's our role within Natural England is to make sure that we're connecting within within what's already going on so I think it's 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 building on what's existing not re it's not a reinvention this it's about you know uh, bringing together I know that's a bit of a wishy-washy answer I, I, I don't I don't want to give false hope they say oh you can ring me and I'll sort it out because I think the reality is that we, we, we we're still in a process of finding our feet and you know and and um, yeah, I mean, Tony might have a better answer than that. Sorry, Tony. Tony, you're on mute. Yeah, I've got it now. Yeah. So in terms of how people get involved, I, 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 there are obviously a lot of actors involved in all of this beyond us. And the idea of, of the Nature Recovery Network 
being built up from the bottom through the local nature recovery strategies you know it, it, it it's about bringing in the entire community and that will be led by local government and that might be the best way to get involved uh, and you know insofar as we will be facilitating and providing expert input um it might be that you know in terms of that community side and bringing views in from people who live in particular parts of the country it might be more effective to connect via the wildlife trusts for example and some of those other community groups who, who you know are much more kind of engaged with citizens and, and and their participation because natural england you know we're, we're a government body we're a public agency and so fulfilling statutory functions providing expert advice and you know we're obviously pleased to hear from the community and you know do our best to be connected with people but in terms of getting um a, a result from that kind of participation there's probably other others who would be good to speak to as well okay so if people listening contacted their local wildlife trust and said we yes. we've heard that there's going to be a, a local nature recovery yes, strategy exactly. being developed and we're we're keen to yeah. be on your on your list yes, lovely exactly. now I'm, I'm conscious it's there are questions left but it's one o'clock and uh, i need to bring us to a close um Thank you so much, Suzanne and Jenny and Tony, for coming on today and telling us about the Nature Recovery Networks and how they're developing and how people get involved. It's been an absolutely fascinating hour. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you to everyone who has joined us today. And I'm sorry that we didn't answer all your questions. Um, I will be sending you the slides and the links from the chat. Please do make it along to the last few webinars that we have this week and please do get out recording in your chat charts. Uh, thank you all for coming and goodbye. Thank you, Catherine. Bye bye, everyone.